Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Plain Bagel. I'm your host, Richard Coffin. It's been less than two weeks since we had our last Lehman Brothers moment in the market with gilts in the UK. And since that's now somewhat reversed with the government there doing a U-turn on their tax cut proposal, I think markets got a little bored and wanted to find another Lehman Brothers moment. And we now have it, thanks to the name that you've probably seen over this past weekend blowing up on Twitter and finance social media. Credit Suisse. Now, if you've heard of Credit Suisse before and you live outside of Switzerland, it's probably been for mostly bad reasons because they have a pretty nasty track record of, of uh, not only kind of bad luck at times, but also bad ethics <laughs> and, and bad uh, operations in terms of running their business. From money laundering, forging signatures, dealing with human rights abusers, taking a $5.5 billion hit from the default of Archegos Capital, and even recently for spying on a former executive that left their company to work for a competitor. Um, so not a very well-loved bank. But as mentioned today, Credit Suisse is in the news because many fear that it might be kicking off the next Lehman Brothers moment. You see, outside of their regular banking operations within the country of Switzerland, Credit Suisse is a fairly large international investment bank with wealth and asset management services as well as investment banking services and they are relatively large. They're the second largest bank in Switzerland, one of the biggest banks in Europe. And in November of 2021, the Financial Stability Board actually included Credit Suisse in their list of global systemically important banks, or GSIBs for short, meaning that their failure could have implications for the global financial system, AKA, they are too big to fail. And over this past week and weekend, people were worried that that was exactly what was about to happen, that Credit Suisse was on the brink of failure. Why, you might ask? Well, because executives for the company said that the firm was doing fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's a little flippant, definitely an oversimplification of, of the situation. There's a lot more to it, but there is a little bit of truth to that uh, because over the last few years and especially over the last few quarters, the company has not been performing well. Their net interest income has been falling since 2014 and the company has reported a net loss of nearly 4 billion US dollars over the last three quarters alone. And while some of this is certainly company specific, there is a big macro factor playing a role here as well because rising rates, while they are generally good for a lending business for a company that operates as a bank that provides loans, it also tends to be a detriment to investing businesses, which this company has a big investing arm as well. Rising interest rates, for example, can increase the cost of borrowing, can increase investment fees or trading fees, and can also lead to the decrease of the value of assets that are held as collateral for loans, which can cause different problems there. And last week, this culminated into the CEO of the bank, whose name I'm going to butcher, but Ulrich Korner, uh, telling his staff in a memo that the bank, although it was facing a critical moment, quote unquote, that had solid liquidity and capital because the bank, if you aren't aware, is actually expecting to do a restructure. On October 27th, they're releasing a new strategic plan and the CEO was actually brought in in July as an expert in restructurings to help scale back the company's investment banking and to cut more than $1 billion in costs. And even over the weekend, executives carried this message in a campaign, reaching out to clients, investors, and counterparties to let them know that the bank was doing okay. And people didn't believe them. <laughs> a lot of people assume that the company doesn't have the cash it needs to carry out this massive restructuring, that it could need anywhere from four to six billion francs, which roughly translates into US dollars. Not to mention that just in this macro environment, there's a lot of execution risk with rising rates and high inflation. There's a lot that could go wrong very easily. And needless to say, it did not help the situation when an ABC reporter posted in a now deleted tweet that quote, Credible source tells me a major international investment bank is on the brink, with many speculating that this guy is talking about Credit Suisse. And overall, there's a lot of fear around Credit Suisse right now, so much so that the Swiss regulator FINMA, as well as the Bank of England, where the company actually has a fairly large hub, mentioned that they would be monitoring the situation. The stock has fallen to an all-time low as of Monday, being down over 80% over its entire history. Bond prices for the company have dropped as well, and as you've probably seen the many, many, many headlines talking about, credit default swaps for Credit Suisse bonds have skyrocketed in price, reaching a five-year spread of 250 basis points, or 2.5 percentage points. Credit default swap more or less operates as an insurance contract, where the person who buys the credit default swap 
more or less gets protection against a bond defaulting. So in this case, if you own Credit Suisse bonds and you buy a credit default swap, you would get a payout, a protection payment, if you will, if Credit Suisse defaults. So the value of that credit default swap increases as the risk of Credit Suisse defaulting increases. So with prices skyrocketing, a lot of traders are pricing in a higher risk of Credit Suisse failing to pay its bonds, which is why that matters. And credit default swaps are quoted as a percentage that represents the premium payment that the buyer pays on a regular basis as a percentage of the notional value of the contract. Now, I have this awesome graph to show how Credit Suisse compares to competitors when it comes to the price of these credit default swaps. But to put it further into perspective, on this Friday, the credit default swaps at close were at 355 basis points, which is the highest they've been in over two decades for the company. And for reference, at the beginning of the year, the credit default swaps were below 60 basis points. So they've gone up quite a bit. And according to Fortune, with this pricing around credit default swaps, traders are pricing in a 23% chance that the bank defaults on its bonds within the next five years. So that's why people are nervous about Credit Suisse. Not only are times tough for the company, not only is it a terrible macro environment for them, and you know executives are calling people, making them nervous by saying that <laughs> everything's okay. There's also the fact that traders in the market are pricing in a relatively high risk, even though there's a more probability that they don't default, but a raised risk, if you will, for the company defaulting on its bond payments, which obviously is enough to make anyone nervous when you have a such a globally important financial institution. But with all these comparisons of Credit Suisse to Lehman Brothers, there is a lot of fear mongering right now in the markets. Now, because Credit Suisse is a publicly traded stock, let me be very clear here. I'm not recommending a buy for the stock. I'm not recommending a sell or a short. Credit Suisse, yes, has not been doing well over the last few years, and they do face a heightened risk of failure when compared to peers. So that's all stuff you should be aware of, whether that's a buy opportunity, a sell, whatever, that's outside the scope of this video. But what I will say here is that these comparisons to Lehman Brothers are really overblown and leave out a lot of important details in terms of how these two institutions drastically differ from what Lehman Brothers was in 2008 to what Credit Suisse is in 2022. First of all, let me clear something up around the size of Credit Suisse relative to Lehman Brothers. There's some confusion about assets versus assets under management. They are two separate things. But for reference, the total assets for Credit Suisse as of the second quarter of 2022 was 753.5 billion US dollars, uh, which is marginally larger than what Lehman Brothers was. At May close of 2008, Lehman Brothers had 639.4 billion US dollars. But when you account for inflation, the numbers are actually pretty close to one another. So they are relatively the same size. Yes, Credit Suisse does have 1.45 trillion US dollars in assets under management, but this is actually different from total assets. Total assets refers to what the bank owns, if you will. Assets under management is what clients hold through Credit Suisse, but it belongs to the clients. It's client money and client assets that are invested through Credit Suisse's services. But if Credit Suisse goes under, those assets go to the clients. It's the client's property. Secondly, continuing on the theme of balance sheets, Credit Suisse is in a better financial position than Lehman Brothers was before its collapse. And I know when a lot of people compare stuff to Lehman Brothers, they're more so talking about the event and the unfolding of you know financial systems rather than directly comparing a company to Lehman Brothers. But you can do that. <laughs> we have the power to go back and see the old financial statements of Lehman Brothers before it went under. Uh, you can use the Edgar website, which is an SEC resource, and see the financial statements as of May end of 2008. And if you compare that to Credit Suisse, you can see a few notable things. For one, cash on hand for Lehman Brothers was roughly 3.1% of total assets, compared to Credit Suisse, which has cash and cash due from banks, of 21.9% of its total assets. Now, just looking at cash is obviously very short-sighted. So if you instead look at securities, which are kind of the main source of concern here is the securities exposure that Credit Suisse might have. For Lehman Brothers, 88.2% of their assets were securities related, including 46.1% being collateralized agreements compared to Credit Suisse, where all the investment assets represent just 30.1% of their total asset amount, with most of the balance sheet having to do with lending activity. And with the two balance sheets, you can also calculate something known as leverage ratio, which is the bank's total assets divided by their shareholders equity. And it shows how much the bank has levered itself up, how much it's grown its, its asset base using liabilities, right? Compared to equity. And for Lehman Brothers, as of May end of 2008, that figure sat at 24.3 times. 
compare that to Credit Suisse as of the second quarter of 2022 at 15.9 times. Not quite half, but not far off. Now, the third big difference to consider when looking at Lehman Brothers versus Credit Suisse are the regulations that have occurred since Lehman Brothers and because of Lehman Brothers, because of the collapse or the near collapse of the U.S. financial system. Importantly, Basel III and the Dodd-Frank Act in the U.S. Now, the Dodd-Frank Act specifically has to do with the U.S., so we'll focus on Basel III. Basel III was an international framework that was adopted by a number of different countries to help ensure that banks didn't experience another 2008-like financial crisis. And this accord was adopted by many countries to impose more strict rules about how banks operated to ensure that they had enough capital on hand to deal with stress tests and to absorb losses in the case of a disaster or an unexpected loss, such as with the 2008 financial crisis. And one of these metrics that came with a new minimum that banks had to meet if they wanted to operate was a CET1 ratio, or Common Equity Tier 1 Ratio. And to oversimplify, what this does is it takes a company's Tier 1 assets or equity being basically the money that the company has that belongs to it that would be the first to absorb a loss if the company were to lose money, so shareholders' equity. Um, and it compares that to the company's risk-weighted assets, assets that are weighted based on how risky they are. So something like a mortgage could be rated up to 100% of its weight, something that's low risk or no risk like cash, you know, cash doesn't inherently come with risk, uh, would be weighted 0%. So the ratio looks to measure how much of the loss absorbing or potentially loss absorbing assets the company has on hand relative to risky assets. That's kind of a confusing but oversimplified version of this ratio. Credit Suisse, as of the end of Q2, had a ratio of 13.5%, which is actually above the peer group of 13.1%, and certainly above its minimum of 10.5%. On top of this, Credit Suisse actually has a liquidity coverage ratio of 191%, which according to Financial Times is significantly higher than most of its peers. So it's not to say that Credit Suisse is not in a bad situation. It is to say, however, that to oversimplify things and to say that it's a Lehman Brothers moment that's just like Lehman Brothers, is missing a few important details. In fact, when we talk about capital requirements, these banks that are identified as GSIBs as globally important or significant for the overall financial market, their capital requirements are actually more stringent than other banks and regular regional banks, for example, because regulators know that they come with more risk of causing a financial disaster if they were to go under. Now, importantly, <laughs> stay with me for a second. That's not to say that Credit Suisse is not a risky financial institution, that's not a risky investment, and that there isn't a higher risk of default. Their stock is down quite a bit, and that means that to raise capital, it will be much more expensive, and investors will likely demand much more compensation to absorb the risk that the market has priced into Credit Suisse. So there's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy to having traders price in a lot of risk with your institution. It actually increases the risk of your operations. And when it comes to derivatives, it is worth noting that that risk is a lot harder to gauge. There's a lot of risk that isn't necessarily captured on the balance sheet because the balance sheet is a snapshot of the company's current asset value, but asset values for derivatives move very quickly because of the leverage they introduce, and they can cause a company to lose quite a bit of money very rapidly. So it's not to downplay the risk there. And of course, you know, there's always a chance that a company lies, and with Credit Suisse's you know, history, uh, wouldn't necessarily <laughs> rule that out. Still, my point with this video is that any comparison to Lehman Brothers without highlighting at least some of these details in terms of more stringent regulatory requirements, in terms of the situation of Credit Suisse versus Lehman Brothers when it comes to their asset balance, it's just telling half of the story. And unfortunately, the fear mongering side of the story, the, the side that gets clicks and makes people very concerned and, and nervous about the markets. For all we know, the company might see success with its strategy turnaround that the CEO is proposing. They might be able to sell part of their troubled business or bring on a new investor, which some people are speculating there are already talks underway for that. And well, definitely not an ideal situation. Some also speculate that the government would intervene if this company were to experience a Lehman-like moment, given its global importance. Still, even with all that being said, only time will tell how Credit Suisse performs from here on out. I'm truly not betting one way or the other. It could turn out the next week that Credit Suisse defaults on their bond payments. That's not the point here. The point is that there's not much point to speculating about these types of things. And I think there's no better example of why speculating on this type of stuff is kind of silly when it's based a lot on rumors and a lot on hearsay.
than with Bed Bath & Beyond. Because if you remember around the time I posted that video about Bed Bath & Beyond, a lot of people were speculating that Ryan Cohen, the guy who sold his big stake in the company that sent the share tumbling, a lot of people were speculating that he was gonna come in the next week and announce that he was buying a big part of the business, Bye Bye Baby. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> were diehard believers <laughs> that that was going to happen on vast speculations uh, with intricate theories turned out to not be true, <laughs> you know, and that's the problem with relying on rumors for an investment strategy. So just focus on the fundamentals that you can see and consider the risks that you can't see. That's important with banks, especially with derivative products. And yeah, if you see a headline mentioning Lehman Brothers, take a pause, <laughs> read through it and see if, if it's a superficial comparison or if there's really a real reason why that name's being brought up again. Anyway, that's the video. I hope it helped to explain the Credit Suisse situation. I know it got a little convoluted at times, but hopefully it helps to simplify things and to explain why, while Lehman Brothers comparison might make sense at a superficial level, we dive deep into it. There are a lot of things to consider as well uh, that don't paint as scary as a picture. Still a higher risk company that you need to be cautious with. It's not to downplay that at all. Uh, but thank you for joining me. I hope you found the video enjoyable, helpful. If you did, please do make sure to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And let me know your thoughts on the situation in the comments down below. As always, thanks for giving me the time of day and be safe out there.